directly, basically, with our GPS. And so we were kind of worried, what happens if they finish their Galileo system, equip all the European planes with it, and say, you have to have this to fly over European airspace. We already have an ailing industry here to have to sort of retrofit all the airplanes just to fly there. That was like, that was bad. So, so we're there in the room trying to understand because they could use our system for free. They have to pay for that. So we're trying to understand that. And they're sitting at the table kind of smug. And I'm pretty sure that our chairs were a little lower than theirs. <laughs> I have this memory because I remember looking up to them. And my, you know, my torso, you know, I've measured, you know, this length. And uh, I should not have been looking up to that guy at that table. I, so I think they had that pre-choreographed. But anyhow, he was smug. And you know something? Something gelled in my head. Again, all I have power of is thought. I can't, that's all I can do. So I thought. And I got livid. Livid. I remember. Why did I get livid? I got livid because it all was clear. We were at that table talking about aerospace product as though it was soybeans. As though, well, what are the trade regulations? What are the tariffs? What are your restrictions? Will you do this if we do? And I'm thinking, there's something wrong here. Aerospace is a frontier of our technological prowess. And if you're on the frontier, you don't sit at a table negotiating usage rights. Because you, you're so far ahead of everybody, you don't even care what they want. Give it to them, because you're over here. And that's the state that we lived in for most of the 20th century. You know this. The 50s, 60s, 70s, and part of the 80s, every plane that came and landed at your city was made in America. Air Pakistan was a Boeing 747. So then I got angry, not at the smug guy sitting across from me. I got angry at us. I got angry at America. Because advancing is not just something you do incrementally. You want innovation in there as well. Innovation so that you have evolutionary, not incremental, but revolutionary advances. You know what I wanted now? I wanted to be able to take a day trip to Tokyo. That's a 45 minute ride. If you do it right, you go suborbital, come out of the atmosphere, go back in. How come we're not doing that now? Because if we were, we, I wouldn't have been at that table with this smug guy facing me talking about Galileo satellites because we would have had some other pulsar navigation system and we just wouldn't have cared about them. We would have been too far ahead. So I'm angry that aerospace has become a bargaining commodity. And part of me is an educator. When I stand in front of eighth graders, I don't want to have to say to them, become an aerospace engineer so that you can build an airplane that's 20% more fuel efficient than the one your parents flew. That doesn't get them. No, it doesn't. But if I do say, become an aerospace engineer so that you can design the airfoil that'll be the first piloted craft in the rarefied atmosphere of Mars. Become a biologist because we need people to look for life, not only on Mars but on Europa and elsewhere in the galaxy. Become a chemist because I want to understand the chemistry of the moon better. I want to understand the chemistry of space better. You put, you put that vision out there and it makes my job easy because I just have to point them to it. And the ambition rises up within them. The flame gets lit and they guide the path. And so we have a vision statement before us right now. It's laid down. It's moon, Mars, and beyond. Been some controversy on the edges of it, but basically we know it's fundamentally a sound vision. Not enough of the rest of the public knows or understands that. But I have an idea. You know what I want to do? 
If I were Pope of Congress, okay, I would say, Congress, Congress, let me see how I do this. Double NASA's budget, okay? Now, what would that take it? That would take it to 30 billion. Well, somebody else in town has a 30 billion dollar budget. It's the NIH. Well, that ought to have a big budget because health matters. Except that, you know, practically every medical instrument used by medical doctors was invented by a physicist. So you can't just fund medicine. You have to fund the rest of what's going on, from x-ray machines to MRIs, formerly known as NMRs. You know MR MRI, magnetic resonance imaging? That comes from nuclear magnetic resonance. But that has the N word. <laughs> so you have to remove the N, fix it, and so then people will go inside the cavity, okay? <laughs> Anyhow, physicists invent, engineers invent this, not the medical doctors. There's a cross-pollination there that is fundamental to that enterprise. So you double NASA's budget, and what happens? What happens? The vision becomes big. It's real. And you attract an entire generations and generations to follow into science and engineering professions. You know, and I know, that all emergent markets in the 21st century are going to be science and technologically driven. The foundation of our economy will require it. And if you stop innovating, what happens? Everybody else catches up and your jobs go overseas. And then you cry foul, oh, well, they're paying them less over here, over there, and the playing field is not level. Stop whining about that and get back and innovate. So true innovation, you know what that is? You know, because they say. If you want spin-off products, why not just invest in the product straight instead of waiting for it to happen as a spin-off? It just doesn't work that way. For example, if you're an expert on thermodynamics, let's just say you're an expert, the world's expert on heat. And I say, build me a better oven. You might invent a convection oven or one that's more insulated, one that's got better access to its contents. But you know something? No matter how much money I give you, you will not invent a microwave oven because that came from another place. It came from investments in communications, in radar. It, the klystron in the microwave oven is traceable to the war effort, not traceable to some thermodynamician. And you know about the Hubble telescope. When it was first launched, it had the bad mirror, remember that? We had two years before it was fixed, what are you gonna do with the telescope? We still took data, fuzzy data, and we said, well, what are we gonna do with the data? I don't know. Then it was an algorithm guy, computer science guy. He said, well, I know how to do that. Here's an algorithm I just wrote that can maximize the information you can extract from that picture. We invoked it, we used it for those three years. Somebody else said, hey, it's a good algorithm. We can use that for the early detection of breast cancer on mammograms. So right now, lives are being saved simply because of the mistake in the Hubble mirror and the solution to try to minimize the impact of that. That's the kind of cross-pollination that goes on all the time. And you know something else? That's why futurists always get it wrong. Because you know what they do? They take what is now and they just extrapolate. They don't see things coming in that are surprises to the phenomena. So they just always get it wrong. They get it right for about five years and they're hopeless after 10. So let me, let me go into my denouement here with the following observation. Again, all I could do is share thoughts with you. I claim that space is part of our culture. And I don't think you fully feel what I mean by that statement. You know what culture is? By the way, you've heard complaints, oh, nobody knows the names of the astronauts, nobody gets excited with the, nobody, and so there's this lament that nobody cares anymore, except people in the industry. I don't believe that for a minute. You know why? Because I have